there is a problem with the uh, built tools and especially Gretel mm. because it's a huge, huge uh, amount of material. And uh, if you want to dig deeper, it will take like uh, a week to go there because we we had this course about mm. uh, IT tools. Uh, this semester it's like uh, 10 lectures and half of them about different built tools uh, it's it's on the, the top of the iceberg so today i will uh, give an overview about how different uh, built tools and not all of them but only the most convenient one works and where does everything go and of course i want to stop and demonstrate some things using Gradle. It's not the most uh, modern thing, but probably it aggregates a lot of features from different tools, so you can get the idea. And of course, why it is important for me, because Kotlin ecosystem is now mostly uh, uses Gradle as a build system. So let's, let's, uh, and I, I also want to apologize, I wanted to to publish an article before this meeting and make more material, but I had some circumstances, so <laughs> it's not that much information I need in the presentation. Of course, you can ask questions and uh, we can discuss things. That's what seminars are made for. So uh, when we are talking about uh, build system, the first question is, do we actually need a build system? And it's it's not it's not the empty question. A lot of people are asking this, especially from scientific background. They say, why do we need a build system when we can write a script which does everything? After all, all our compilers, all our um, tools come with some kind of uh, uh, common like tools to um, make it work. For example, if we, I will demonstrate everything in Java because uh, for, for several reasons, but uh, one of them is that uh, Java build is actually a very straightforward. It's a uh, st one-stage build and one-stage packaging uh, compared to C++, for example, where you have at least three stages in, inside, inside the build itself. So basically, uh, when we want to or build a Java program, we need to compile Java files, files with a Java extension, two class files, which are by JVM bytecode, and then uh, bundle them together into a zip file and rename, uh, call it jar. Jar and zip are the same thing, but with different names. And we can do that. And I got this uh, question uh, answered quite uh, fast from Stack Overflow. But of course, now uh, nobody really do that because yes, we get the full flexibility. We can do everything, but um, it is almost impossible to maintain the pro program written in this way because uh, we do not have incremental compilation. Uh, other here who do, do not know what incremental compilation is, please write a, write a hand and I will explain. Okay, everybody knows that uh, incremental compilation is not pretty. Uh, reproducibility. Uh, you can't expect that the script will work the same way on a different computer because it will have a different paths, uh, different packages installed and uh, everything will be different so you will have to adjust the script for each computer and even different brands on the same computer for example you switch uh, like on the environment and you will get different results uh high probability of years because there are no ways to debug uh, bash script uh, or even check if it works correctly and if your build takes like half an hour and breaks somewhere in the end it's frustrating, really. And I also said about maintainability. When you change something and another guy comes and he can't or she can't read whatever you did here, and even I, I know how I know how uh, Java compilation works, but 
I'm not sure what these things means. I do not work with the batch a lot. And uh, when different shell, it will be different syntax, and there's a, a lot of ways to do it. So, this thing called manual assembly, and it's a bad thing because uh, you will never do it again, or will never change everything. So, nobody does it. That's safe for some scientific guys who really do that. And I hate what is there for me. Okay, uh, that tool you probably all know, uh, and probably most of you use, is uh, uh, GNUME, which is uh, more or less the best example of uh, simple. Unix way and simplicity in one, in one uh, box. Uh, uh, how does it work? Uh, they make, uh, introduce one single thing and on top of a uh, bar screen. It introduces, uh, oh, something wrong with the microphone. Is it okay right now? As long as you're talking loudly, it's okay, but you sometimes, some syllables go missing. <laughs> okay, let me check. Maybe I'm using the wrong microphone. Oh, for me, the sound is actually pretty good. Okay, okay maybe, my, maybe, maybe, it's maybe, maybe it's connection. Uh, usually it's okay. Uh, what make introduces on top of a simple script is R tasks. So you can see here, uh, that there are several lines here, like all, jar, clean, those things called tasks, and uh, they are actually tasks. There's something you can run, and probably all, all of you did it at least once, uh, make clean, make install, make whatever. And uh, it also introduces task dependencies. I'm not sure there are in this example, but they should be here. No, it, it does not show dependencies, but uh, what make does is uh, one task could depend on another task. And here, for example, we have a, a separate task for each of uh, files in the directory. And uh, additionally, we can, for example, do and other things like wildcards and set a task for each file with this with an uh, extension like Java. And what we do here for each file with extension Java in specific directory, we call this Java C program, which compiles it to the bytecode. And then uh, for each class, which produced from this file, and uh, Java is very nice in this way because it produces a class file for each Java file. It is not the same in Kotlin, by the way. Uh, and then creates a manifest file which is needed to run your program from the Java. So it's pretty neat. And uh, additionally, it depends, or one of them depends on another. So when you call, for example, all, uh, you compile all classes and pack them into the jar, and everybody is happy. Uh, and of course, it saves you from some mistakes. For example, you forget some kind of step in the uh, build, uh, it will be done automatically. And clean, of course, cleaning the resources is very important uh, for maintaining your program. Otherwise, it uh, gets blocked. Uh, Additionally, make could uh, work incrementally. So when uh, it works with the files, and if file uh, fingerprint does not change, I think it doesn't be the fingerprint that uses the date of last edit. If uh, the date of last edit does not change, it does not recompile, recompile the file and the task associated with the file. And of course, inside the task, you can do everything that's usually like a bash script or whatever. But of course, there are a lot of limitations in make as well. So I'm not sure, uh, but uh, I haven't seen a lot of bare make file used in ages. People do it for very specific tasks, but not for a large project. 
Why? Because again, the problem of the environment is still there. You need to set up your environment, conda, compiler, whatever. Otherwise, you will get an unpredictable result. The maintenance is better than with a, a shell script, but it's still not good because inside the task, you still have this uh, shell script. And uh, if the shell script is like, I don't know, 100 lines, uh, it is very hard to maintain their uh, shell script 100 lines. Unreadable, yes, again, because, because it's inside those tasks we have a, a shell script. And another thing uh, uh, which appears in May and may, makes it complicated is a no dependency metric. So you can't load one project from another one. Because of course you can, because you can do anything with me, but there are no internal mechanism. There is no project model and you can't do that. And of course I have not, for some reason, I have not uh, put it here, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure. Have you seen uh, industrial make files lately? They like uh, thousands lines of, code, lines of code. It's just uh, impossible to work with them. So what people do is they create uh, generators, different different generators to generate those make files. By the way, make make is not the only one tool uh, out there. For example, there is a, a ninja tool which is similar to make, but it uh, uses less human readable uh, description and more machine readable description for those tasks. And it's, it's, it is better in parallelizing and uh, incremental compilation. So the tools here, like CMake, AutoTools, Maison, and some, there are some other tools like Rake, uh, they mm, uh, make this two-stage two stage build. First stage is a configuration stage, uh, which is done via the tool, like CMake, Maison, uh, and they generate the make file or ninja file or something similar. And uh, the second stage is calling actual low level tool like make to run tasks. So, wait, sorry. Uh, so uh, here is a part of documentation of CMake for Java. Yes, there is a actually CMake module for Java. And it's pretty complicated. It's like uh, several screens of just a description of this module. And of course, when I listened to it, I found out that it's pretty, it, it lacks a lot of things you need to uh, make a complete Java build, but have a lot of things you do not need, like uh, native interoperability, because it was made just to integrate Java and C code together. Uh, the similar thing, uh, and uh, what is important here, that CMake uses its own special language to define with its own special grammar. It's not similar to anything uh, which uh, is used to describe. Uh, more modern tool is a Maison, uh, which uh, I had to use, for example, in uh, Dukes, uh, in which is developed in Daisy, they use Meson. And the language here is uh, uh, Python-like, but it's not Python, actually. Uh, it, it makes it complex. Yeah. But in general, it's the same approach. We make a description, uh, imperative, imperative code in some kind of uh, language. Uh, and it generates the make file or ninja file, which is uh, then compiled. Uh, it is very good for those specific cases it was designed for. For example, CMake is probably the top tool and maybe the only tool you should use for C++ because it's uh, a lot of examples and uh, 
even some plugins, but mostly a lot of documentation about it. But of course, since it is a specialized language to do a description of special, specific parameters of those tasks, it's usually bad for other cases. As I said, for example, building CMake to build Java is probably a bad idea if you do not want to do interoperability with the C. It's inflexible. You can't add new uh, tasks, and it's, especially it's complicated in CMake because if you want to create an additional model to CMake, it is possible, but then you need to write it in C++ and then you need to compile it in uh, your machine and install it somewhere and you can't just give it to somebody because uh, he or she will need to get the source code, compile it, install it on the local machine and only then use it. It's, it's very complicated. Uh, CMake does not have, at least it, it does not have a good project model. So basically it's just a way to declare parameters for predefined tasks. So you can't operate on uh, things like source sets, files, dependencies, or whatever. You can only include them. And of course, again, it does not have dependency management. Uh, Meson have some rudimentary dependency man uh, management system, but it uh, all comes to like install something in the, the inner directory and so no, no transitive dependencies. But, and, other things, no version resolution. So it is probably good, but only for good for pretty simple things in C++, uh, not other languages. Uh, and you probably know I'm, I'm not a fan of C++. Uh, you can ask questions and we can discuss it, but it is uh, how I see it. Uh, it's a discussable thing, of course. What comes next, uh, but probably before, because it was is a pretty old tool, uh, but I need to mention it. It's Apache Ant. It's made for Java, and it was the first Java built tool besides the shell script. And it's pretty like Make. The only key difference is here is that it uses not some arbitrary language but it used XML as a carrier. Uh, it's actually a good idea. It looks looks uh, terrible, but it is actually a good idea because one of the problems the make and CMake, by the way, is that you can't, uh, there are no good ways to integrate it with the IDE or your tooling because uh, there are, the language uh, there is just not made to be uh, IDE friendly. And uh, it is pretty hard to parse this text and create an object model. In Ant, uh, at least the parsing part is made much easier because it uh, represented in the machine readable format. But of course, it's much harder for user to create things. So Ant is not used right now, at least it's not used widely. <sighs> but it's still functional, of course. Uh, what came next is the very important thing, which is called Apache Maven. Maven is actually a revolutionary thing on di in uh, several different, uh, for, for, for several different reasons. And also, uh, Maven also uses XML as a uh, description model. But it does not use imperative uh, model. It does not say what to do. It declares uh, so-called plugins, uh, a program which does some work and configuration for those plugins. So it is fully declarative. So no comments on the properties and plugins. Uh, it introduces a life cycle. If you have questions, I can answer about life cycle, but it will uh, move us I think, out of schedule. It's a very interesting concept, which I think is not used anywhere besides the Maven, but it's a very important and very, very interesting concept. Uh, so you have, ah, I think I have a slide about it. 
Uh, another thing is a convention or a configuration. I also have a slide about it and I tell you about because it's very important, uh, important uh, thing. And uh, Maven has a basic project model. So yes, you have a programmatically work with a project model. And what is what, what was a huge revolution in this field, Maven has automatic dependency. So Maven uh, is able to by download some kind of dependency by name and actually download transitive dependencies as well. You don't need to install anything when you call Maven build, it automatically loads dependency from a repository of your choosing and install them. And it, it is used in all modern build tools. Uh, you can't live without. Let us stop uh, in key points. Life cycle, as I said, it's very beautiful uh, thing, not used everywhere, but but beautiful. That you do not have a order of application of your plugins. Each plugin could attach itself to one or several life cycle stage. And when we uh, do a build, we do not run a task. Maven does not have task. My, uh, my, Maven does have those life cycle stages. So when you do a life cycle stage, we uh, are sure that we did all life cycle stages before. For example, if you do verify, we are sure that we validated, compiled, tested, and packaged uh, our application and uh, applied all the plugins uh, which use those stages. It's very interesting. Uh, and of course, uh, Maven works with a file tree. So now we are come, we have a, a project model and we have a file tree in our build directory. It's called target in Maven. Uh, uh, so we, we are working with both. Uh, the uh, project model is configured by this POM XML file and the tree is modified during the build. Uh, convention over configuration. Again, it's not only Maven or Radar. All uh, modern build tools use it to some extent. The idea is in, in C++ and Bash script, you put your files anywhere you want, and then you need to set exact paths to each file in your build tool, and you can't avoid it. But in Maven, uh, it, uh, there was a convention introduced. So they say, let us make convention that all sources are placed in this directory, so SRC, source set name language, in case of Java, SRC, main, Java. And all sources are there. All resource files in this SRC main resources, all test files in SRC test Java, etc. So we do not need to declare those paths in our build file in case uh, we put files in default locations. Of course, you can override those default locations from your build file, but you do not need to uh, do it if you use a default structure. This is called convention over configuration. You mean, it means that you can configure things, but uh, if you did not configure it, the defaults are used. It's very convenient things. And, and again, you will see these directory structure in different build tools, not necessarily Maven. They just took this concept, which is very nice. Uh, and, and of course, conventional, conventional over configuration works not only for file paths, but for other things as well. Uh, almost everything have a this or that convention. Uh, if you do not declare it, then use the whole. Okay, uh, dependency management. Uh, Maven introduced this following scheme for dependency management. It's a three part scheme. First one is a group or package. Second one is a name. Uh, and the third one is a version. The group usually represents the organization you work for or the project you work for. And it is using this so called uh, reverse uh, mm, domain name. Notation. In our case, for example, we are npm laboratory at MIPT, and our site is npm MIPT rule, 
So the reverse name is rule nipped in pair. So when we want to find all uh, things under nipped, we need to search for root nipped, and we will probably get things uh, corresponding to this. Uh, the second name is the actual name of your package, library, application, whatever, and the version is self-explanatory. Uh, the thing is that the name is not necessarily unique. Uh, a lot of modern build tools use a single name for the package, and it's not very convenient because several people could decide that they want to name the package in this, with this, the, the same way. It is usually a problem in the JavaScript in the system in the NPM, not in PM as laboratory, but in PM as most package manager. Uh, they use uh, the same name for different things, and it, it's complicated uh, a lot. And now in Maven, it was avoided by introducing this group, and different group can have the same package name. Uh, transitive dependency resolution is very important. So if you depend on the, some kind of module and this module depends on other module, this will be resolved transitively. There are different rules. For example, Maven and Gradle have a slightly different rules, but you will get it anyway. Uh, a step forward is the repository management. You do not have only one global module repository. You have a several one and you can attach different repositories. It's very convenient. And another thing I may have introduced is dependencies codes. So you could have a different set of dependencies for your uh, production code, for your testing, uh, for your additional things like benchmarks. So there are dependencies scopes in case of Maven, there are, uh, sorry, I, I think I wrote not Maven, but Gradle dependency scopes, but it, it works the same way. So you have a compile scope in Maven. Uh, it means that what you want to deploy with your product, there is a scope, uh, I think it's called provided, uh, that says that those artifacts should not be deployed and they should be present in the system where you deploy your application. And it takes uh, some time to study different scopes, but it's not, it's not very hard. And uh, different scope have a different set of dependencies. And finally, we are coming to Gradle. Uh, Gradle is the tool that was created somewhere like 2011, 2012. I remember it very well because uh, more or less at this time, I've started to uh, work on uh, automatic data processing pipelines uh, in Java. And I was studying different ways how to process, uh, automatically process multiple data uh, through tasks. And the Gradle had very similar uh, ideology. And I was studying it and I was pretty excited. I'm not the only one who thinks in these terms. Since then, our thoughts diverged. <laughs> Somehow, I will tell a little bit about it later. But what is important, uh, Gradle uh, was created to mitigate uh, the primary problem with Maven. I haven't talked about the problem, but there is a problem here. Actually, uh, in order to do something with Maven, you need to create a plugin. And it's not that simple. It's more like, it works more like a CMake. So you need to create a plugin, you need to deploy it to Maven Central or somewhere like this, and only then you can download and use it. So it takes some steps to introduce additional functionality or tweak uh, existing functionality. In Maven. And of course, uh, manually editing XML is boring, but I think it's not the main problem here. There could be some editors on top. Uh, Gradle uh, tried to take the best things from Maven. It, it uses Maven dependency management uh, and it uses uh, transitive de dependencies. Uh, it, it is compat fully compatible with Maven, so it could uh, import Maven artifacts. Uh, 
uh, it, it uses more or less Maven conventions and the convention or configuration. So migration from Maven to Gradle is very simple, but it does not use a life cycle. It uh, actually takes a, a thing from make and it uses task graph instead. So in uh, Gradle, uh, you have a main independency management, but the uh, task graph and it, uh, another thing it introduced, it said that, uh, yeah, make is terrible, but why? Because we use some kind of uh, special language to define our builds or see main. Let us use some industrial scale language because it was groovy uh, to define our build. To define our build, it was pretty nice idea. idea. It allowed uh, to make really, really complex things. For example, Android build. I'm not sure a lot of people here understand why Android build is so hard, but it actually is. It takes a several uh, very complicated steps to prepare an application to run in Android and deploy and everything else. And Gradle allowed it almost immediately. That's why, for example, right now, probably 99% uh, of Android is using Gradle. Uh, it, it uses a uh, rather heavy project model. So a lot of things, it's not a lightweight project model like in Maven, but more and more like a programmatical, very complicated project model. And by the way, that's one of the problems with the Gradle, it's over complicated. Uh, it uses uh, plugins, but they not work as uh, Maven plugins. They're not, does not work, do not work on the files. They work on this project model, actually. So, uh, Gradle plugins mostly operate on the project model. And they made a lot of tools, uh, and put a lot of effort to connecting all this to the ID not through the parsing of this Gradle file, but the Gradle itself as a build tool supports protocols to communicate with the ID. And uh, in the end, what we have in Gradle, uh, uh, build file for Java, for example, it looks like this. Basically, it's the same thing in, as in Maven. We declare the Java plugin, we declare the property version, we declare the repository, and we declare a dependence. That's all we need to create Java. It looks, it looks uh, declar fully declarative, but in fact, it, it is not. What we have here, you're probably already familiar with the syntax, it's a function call. So this function call is the uh, imperative function, but it, it changes not files, but it changes the project model. Okay, so it's time for the for the demo. I will switch my screen, and you can you can ask questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. Let's add this the elephant in the room about the yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, the elephant is is the. Uh, uh, Great Gradle, Gradle symbol. I'm not sure why. Okay. Uh, here I will show you a simple, um, a simple uh, Gradle demonstration project I made for my students uh, in this course on uh, development tools. And I will explain how things work here. You see a lot of files here. Let me, this probably you know what it's about. It's just a readme. And this you probably also know about. But those files, these, 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 and these are produced by Gradle. So, uh, build Gradle QTS is the only file uh, which is required for the build. And it is Actually, uh, is it okay? I, I think, hope it's okay. Uh, it is actually uh, 
the root of build logic. In this case, it doesn't have anything because I've especially created two module project. So there is no built specific build logic for this uh, root pro root module. It only uh, adds a description. Another file here is at set settings. It's a file that explains the build structure. Uh, it, uh, this one is optional. I can comment it out and it will still work like this. Uh, and what is important here, it says that this project includes two modules, lib and dump. By the way, I also forgot to mention it, but uh, the work with the multi-module project in Maven is complicated. It's really complicated. It was one of the reasons why Gradle has a uh, first-class support for multi-module project. And uh, those things here, there are two files, one of them a batch file, Windows batch file, and one of them is uh, actually a Linux shell script, you can see. The only thing they do is uh, that they install uh, Gradle in your system. So the idea is that when you get this repository, you do not need to install anything in, in your system, GVM only, you need the GVM to run Gradle, but otherwise you do not need to install Gradle itself. So we can uh, just uh, uh, open the terminal and say, okay, I have a uh, Gradle in my system and I can check it, it is there. Uh, take some time to start. Uh, yeah, and here it is. I have a Gradle with a version of 7.3 in my system, it's okay. But, I can also do it by calling this Gradle wood, which, which is a Gradle wrapper. To do this. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's the same version, but it's actually a different, different uh, installation because it, uh, it works without, uh, even even if the system had not this Gradle, it would still work from here. It downloads all necessary things and uh, installs them. Now, uh, additional thing here is the uh, auxiliary directory. It is used only to download this distribution of Gradle, so it's not used otherwise. And let's back to build file. Uh, probably we should start with the mo module itself, and you see that each of our modules have this uh, build Gradle QTS. What QTS means? Uh, as I said, Gradle was first created using Groovy language, and then uh, they, they found that dynamic language is not that nice for complicated things, so they decided to switch to Mm, statically type of language, which is Kotlin, and it became much, much nicer. Now, let us see what we have, have here. And in this file, it's a lib, we have a, a loading the plugin, uh, the, the Kotlin plugin. Uh, I need to specify that it is a um, Kotlin GVM, or actually, I can, I can do it like this. Yeah. yeah, and it will work. And I need to specify version. This one is not part of uh, some bizarre language syntax. It's a simple index function in Kotlin. We can control click in, in here and see that it's a, just a regular function. It's very convenient when you can see what uh, what functions you use do. You, can, you don't have to uh, keep uh, jumping to the documentation side. Then I need to declare dependencies, and here I use only two test dependency. One goes into scope test implementation, means it is used, it is seen only in test and only inside this project. It's not transitive. And GUnit, which is testing framework. Those things I will explain later. And the second, the second file also I can. Uh, 
save some space, oops, some space by using this. Uh, I apply Kotlin plugin, then I apply application plugin. Again, I can control click here and see that it actually, what it does, it applies uh, application uh, plugin, uh, the plugin with the given name. It's just a shortcut. And then I can uh, do my application. For this, I need to declare dependencies. And you see here, I can uh, declare dependency on another project here. Here, I rely on this leak project inside. I can declare external dependency like this one. And I can, since it's a fully fledged language here, I can even introduce new functions inside the build script. So this thing makes it not, not, uh, oops, where did it go? Uh, it's, it's not uh, declarative anymore. Here you are. So I can display declare this language, the library, or I can make a shortcut myself. And if I control click, I will get here. And here I use one of our own libraries just to demonstrate that I can. Uh, I can do more complicated things. For example, this thing here adds additional source subdirectory, for example, for generated files. I added it because one of the guys from previous lectures asked me if I can create a generate uh, new files using uh, build system plugin. Yes, I can. I can create directory and I can put sources there. And usually this is how it's done. Of course, I need to declare an entry point for my application here. And here is how it is done. Again, not, not very declarative anymore, but it does. And uh, what is more important, I can create new tasks here. For example, I uh, can add a, my task and use a Kotlin delegate by not uh, repeating the name. So now when I, let me uh, just see, when I synchronize this build system with my IDE, I will see that a model up will have a task in it in other section and it has a task called my task and I can call it. It will take some time to warm up. Okay. And you see, I have some output from this task. It's a, uh, let's see what it does. It do just takes so-called configuration. Configuration is, uh, uh, in fact, it's a uh, de uh, dependency scope, different dependency scope, which I talked when I, I was talking about Maven. In Gradle, they are called configurations, and I just listing those dependency scopes here. And you see that there's a implementation, content compiler plugin, class pass, a lot of different dependency scopes. Uh, most of them are used internally for some reason. And you see what API and implementation is what we use to work. It, this this uh, task has access to the project model and can help us. And I can also declare task dependencies like this one. Uh, uh, now, if I call, call uh, the build, it will also uh, do the task I, I did. I did not call my task, but a build task depends on my task. So I can work with the task graph as well. And by the way, I can, uh, different task can reference uh, task from different projects. So this task graph is uh, multi-project as well. This is how it works. And Actually, let's see. Let's see what the application does. It creates a directory, and it has a very simple "Hello World" application. And uh, but it actually uses it uses uh, one property import from additional model, a different model. 
uh, as a reminder, I put the dependency there. So we can control click. By the way, by the way, I forgot to tell, you always can uh, control click and see what what uh, the function does. It's very convenient. Uh, so control click here, and we're seeing that this project, what it does, what it does, it loads uh, the resource file called version in resource folder and uh, and uh, reads its content as a string. That's all. Now let's see where this file located. This file is here. Uh, this file is here and it has a uh, name unknown. What, what, what is this? I want, I want to use, um, it's rather a typical task, I want to use a version of my application inside this application. So, uh, of course, the, the code does not know its version. The version is a part of uh, the build process, but I want to reference this version from there. For that, I've created this file, but again, I've created in compile time. I can update it manually by hand each time I change version, but I do not like it. I want to create a task that will update its version automatically. Let's see how it is done. Uh, I've created a new task called create version file. It uh, creates a version file called version in my in the root of my build directory if i run build right now let me do that i run build on the root uh, root project which automatically runs build on each of sub project uh, and shows excluded files and here is the build and yes here it is it's created a file called version here and the version is the same as the one i've set for my project all projects here apply some kind of configuration to all sub projects including this project and this file did not change at all and uh, now uh, we need to uh, see how this file uh, goes to the um, actual resources when I run a program. Uh, here it is. I get the existing task called process resources and I can see that it is uh, here, tasks, and I don't remember properly what section it, it is in, probably in other. Yes, here it is. We have a task called process resources and I take this task and I say that this task now depends on create version file and it uh, does copy uh, the file, this version file, into the directory called resources main, uh, which is used as a source of uh, as a source of resources for our final bundle. I can delete it. I can delete it here. And uh, I, I've deleted this file, and now I can call call task. Uh, no, uh, compile Kotlin. And no file here. No, the file is not created. But when I call process resources, this file is created. Right. And now and that's all that's actually that's all because now from my main file i can uh can switch it here it's from demo uh we can run this file from the id and here it is the proper version is here or we can do the same and instead of running from idea we can run it from gradle because we have a beautiful application run task gradle and here it is here we you can actually do a server here in gradle which sets up the debug environment for example it's done this way for javascript and for some 
server debugging things, and you can run it in Kernel as well. It's pretty nice. Okay, uh, I hope I showed you basic thing. Uh, of course, uh, this approach, like uh, adding tasks here, has its positive and negative sides. Uh, the negative side is it becomes bloated, and it's not that easy to make a complicated task which does not interfere with anything. But uh, there are ways to do that. You can create a Gradle plugin. There is a such thing as called a build SRC, uh, and uh, other things. Mm, of course, of course. I can say that it's a silver bullet or whatever. There are some problems here as well. Not only that we are going the make way and uh, bloating our build script with some code, but also the application of plugins is uh, becomes complicated because when we enter these uh, plugins here, we introduce a time of application. And when we have time, we have an order. And it becomes clear that the order of application of plugins matters. And the plugins start to interfere with each other. And uh, the project model we are using here is rather complicated. Uh, so when you try to develop your own Gradle product uh, plugin, you need to study all that like for several days. Uh, I prefer it to say CMake, where you can't change anything. You can just have to dig uh, the documentation and see for existing solution. But still, it's not ideal, and I think it will change in future. I was going to finish my article about that uh, until today, but uh, said I am not. I hope I will publish it uh, this week about deficiencies of the Gradle. Uh, OK. Uh, you can ask your question. Meanwhile, I want to switch back to presentation and give uh, one more slide. Oh, I have questions. So the final slide, the final slide. Ah, oh, oh, of course, limitations. It's not final. Uh, it's over complicated. The project model is really huge and it's two language. Historically, it was Groovy, now it's Kotlin, and there are things that are there from Groovy and they have improved. Uh, as I said, a lot of problems with the configuration order. But you know what? Uh, this question rises, is raised a lot in the community that it's complicated. It's uh, it's hard to understand it, but uh, I found one thing that they all come. Uh, they, they all complain about the features that are not present in the systems like CMake at all. So yeah, it's complicated and it's over-engineered sometimes. But uh, you're comparing something that exists with something that does not. Uh, so the final thing I wanted to discuss is uh, it's actually a question and uh, there is no clean winner here. There are two different approaches uh, to uh, make a build tools. One is so-called buttress included when the build tool does everything like Gradle here. It defines version, it makes documentation, it makes deployment. Or uh, whatever makes coffee. By the way, you can create a Gradle plugin which which makes coffee. It's pretty easy. If, if everyone, if anybody wants, we can do it together. Uh, and the continuous integration tool only calls a specific task of, of the build system. It's one approach. Uh, the second approach is a more classic Unix way. It's uh, the build tool does only the build. Like CMake, for example, or make uh, not make may make more universal, like Meson or CMake, and everything else uh, 
all other tools like documentation to deployment tools are uh, supplied by your target platform or Docker. And those tools are grouped together into CI and call from CI. There is no clo uh, clear winner here. I personally prefer the left way, I mean, the Gradle way, the better included way, because uh, you obviously save a lot of time learning this continuous integration tool, Docker tools, and other tools as well. Everything included in your build system, you can test it locally and you can uh, understand what it does. It, it takes uh, hours and hours of work to understand what, what is happening in the remote continuous integration environment. I have personal experience not so long ago when I was trying to deploy the site. It's not Gradle, it uses Node.js. And uh, the tool which is used to deploy in uh, GitHub, continuous integration, GitHub Actions, was not working properly with the CentOS system where I was deploying it to. And no amount of work I've spent days trying to fix that. And finally, what I did is I've just created a small task in uh, Node.js, which does what I need, and call it from ECI, and it worked perfectly in like half an hour. But again, it's not clear decision here. Uh, there are different approaches. Okay, well, it's almost an hour. So uh, uh, that's all I wanted to tell you about today. And our deep and gradle was very shallow because otherwise we would spend uh, hours and hours in it. But uh, I hope you got the overview. If I may, um, can you go just one moment to the to the limitation of the? Yeah, let me share it again. Uh, where it is? Where it is? Yeah, I think it's closed. Okay, let me uh, let me share it again. Anyway, I guess that um, yeah. The limitation, I agree, like overcomplicated, and um, so we can say uh, most of people complain. It's like uh, there's always this magic touch that <laughs> people uh, sometimes also um, get quite, let's say, frustrated about. And um, but on the other side. I love. I really love that you can use the code to. You can use yes. a language yeah. to uh, to, it is, to it describe is. your building logic. It's very powerful. It has a lot of legacy because mm. it was developed for one things and is now used for different things. Mm. And I think it will if it, it will eventually transform or die because, as I said, there are things in Gradle which could not be resolved right now. For example, the plugin load and mechanics, uh, they block the forward development, but the ideas like uh, that you can use actual industrial language to describe mm. your build and you can make it, it look like declarative, it's very productive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, um, I love the DSL, so, uh, it's quite powerful because you can you you can enforce like uh, also for people which are not really used to which are not familiar they can try to guess at least you know with the uh, completion and so on docs on the on the on just uh, directly in the IDE they can read directly while they are writing the build the build script uh, this is quite uh, yeah yeah actually actually I, I, can, I can show you because it's mm. it's a very simple and obvious thing and there is a difference uh, in things how you do it in um, uh, cmake in cmake you started the documentation in uh, uh, Gradle, Groovy, for example, I also would start to use documentation. In Gradle of Kotlin, I don't know what this thing can do. I strike this and then press dot. Yeah. 
Exactly. And I see what are available methods here. So mm -hmm. I do not need to go to the documentation. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. And coming back to the limitation, if I may, um, because this, I can say, bite me also uh, some a couple of times, like uh, when you use, when you have like list and so on, it's not really clear if you can add or you he will create, uh, because sometimes, you know, you can like, uh, uh, you have search there in this case, and then you have also the plural, I guess, search years. And then you don't know if you can just simply add to the mutable list or the mutable list that you get is just a copy, an internal copy. So even if you add it, it will be no, it will have no effect because it will just it's a dead end and so on. This is something that um, it's it's uh, I can say it's a weakness. And uh, also, um, as you said, it wasn't thought to be. Uh, since the beginning to be implemented in Kotlin. And this means that, for example, all these nice DSL misses the critical feature that it's like, uh, you know, the scoping about uh, the DSL method. This is exactly the reason why, for example, you and I are typing this dot, because if we don't type this dot and then we just control space, then we get all the noise of all the, yes. all the levels. But uh, Kotlin has uh, w already addressed somehow this problem by, by using the DSL marker, where you can basically um, say, where, where you can uh, really confine specific methods and properties to specific yeah. scopes. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the DSL marker is not- uh, It's not implemented. It's, it, but it, yeah. it, it's it's not it's not there fully there yet yeah mm -hmm. but this will uh, be nice as for yeah. lists it's actually uh, there is a good practice when you have some, some kind of list uh, as a property i do not have it here i've searched uh, mm -hmm. if i have it ever just use it like um, this Placebo, yeah, yeah yeah it it will work both on mutable lists and on uh, read only lists the same mm -hmm. way so it helps. Mm. Okay. And nothing. Yeah, that's what that was my my choice. Uh, yes. Okay. We have for more than an hour. If you want, I can show you the plugin, Redwood plugin, and its application, how we use it in our work. If anybody is interested, mm. just a brief glance. Mm. Uh, if you're not, I think we can finish for today. I think people uh, who is not interested can simply leave, and and then you can go. Um, can I can I just yeah. add a little thing just from practice? So uh, uh, jo uh, Giuseppe has uh, successfully blackmailed me to convert uh, actually all of our projects now to to Gradle, which uh, was I, I have to admit it was painful for for some time, but. Uh, been and there were some fights over it, <laughs> but um, in the end, I have to say, compared to compared to Maven, for example, it's super easy to add any kind of custom processing really quickly. You don't need any kind of shitty plugins that you then need to deploy somewhere. It's just like an, a, a few lines of code in the in the Gradle project definition, and uh, that is super cool. So we, we have, for example, with that just added like a little shader compiler to our project. And that was super easy. You can invoke it from the command line. It's, uh, it's not a shader compiler itself, but just the, the Gradle task is like ah, five, five lines of code. Yeah. Uh, I, I also haven't shown you one, one example. It's actually uh, created a book in Gradle. Uh, I won't clone it. I just will give you a link. Let me let me do it. It's the, the documentation in Russian, but but I think you can understand. <laughs> uh, one moment, it's uh, general physics. I will just drop. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 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 a laboratory practice book written in tech. and I was really really frustrated. Uh, where, 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 am I, where is my 
sorry, I, I, I lost my zoom. <laughs> Where I, but, ah, here it is. Uh, uh, let me drop it in chat. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I was really frustrated with the build process for tech because I wanted to build separate, uh, separate chapters uh, uh, separately. And you probably know it's in tech, it's not quite easy. If you have an entry point, you can't, uh, it, it has a preamble and uh, separate chapters, they do not have a preamble because they intended to be inserted into the main file textually. And I created a small uh, Gradle plugin in Groovy. It's old, it's like several years ago, and it works perfectly fine. I, I call it and it's built and transforms in HTML that transforms pictures, whatever you want. Uh, I did a similar thing for my PhD thesis, but I did the build system with Make. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> you, you can, you can, do, of course, you can do it. In, uh, with you know, I, 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 Giuseppe hadn't hadn't converted me to to Gradle back then yet. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, what what I what is uh, in since the the core of Gradle is uh, written in Groovy, it includes actually it includes the um, template engine. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Well, let me let me just show you. Where, where am I? Where am I? Uh, it actually includes a te um, template engine. So uh, if we open the build Gradle file here, so I can actually manipulate. Uh, I'm create a template and ma manipulate those text fragments. In a nice language, Groovy is pretty nice. Cotton is better, but Groovy is pretty nice. So yeah, something like this, and all all we need to do uh, to deploy um, uh, those chapters separately or build them all together. It's nice. And uh, I yeah. <laughs> I promised to uh, so so much definitely so much nicer than the. Make fun yes. Ahead. Yes. It's exactly exactly. So uh, it, as I said, it's it's close to uh, make in some regard, in terms that you can do anything. But uh, two 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 three things three things. It's a dependency mm -hmm. management, which is very important. It's uh, industrial language instead of uh, mutilated bash script, and uh, it is uh, nice description. Uh, uh, bash script is mutilated Perl, and uh, in Make you have uh, some limited bash. Uh, and in the third thing is a project model. So you can not only do things you want, but inter work with the different other plugins, which are already there. And of course, you can use Java libraries, which is very important. Okay, I think we are out of time. <laughs>